Hello everyone. So um, yeah, just uh, for anyone that hasn't heard of Sugru, uh, it's a new material. Um, it looks a bit like plasticine or Play-Doh when you take it out of the pack and it comes in different colours. Um, and then once it's exposed to air, it becomes like rubber. So you can make rubberized things to adapt your stuff. Um, I'm sort of really uh, chuffed because today it's been announced in the best inventions of 2010 by Time magazine with the iPad and stuff. like how I came up with it and how, um, how I brought it uh, from an idea that I had when I was in college all the way through to being a product that people can buy now. Um, but first of all, I'll just sort of set it a bit in context of why I came up with it and why, why I invented it. And the first bit of my talk is just that, to set it into context. So this is the house that I grew up in. Um, it's a really sort of typical Irish farmhouse. So um, a lot of you might know um, how those have grown over time. So in terms of design, they weren't designed as they are now today. Like this house is 300 years old. So it started as two rooms, one room for people and one room for animals. And then over time and over the generations, it grew upwards and then it grew out sideways and then they kicked the animals outside so they grew, it made a shed on the side. Um, and then later then they thought, oh well, we need actually a kitchen, so it came out to the side. Um, so that kind of makes for a very higgledy-piggledy sort of a um, building in the end. So you can see all these different extensions. There's probably 10 extensions on this house. And I mean, they're all built for function, so they're all built to serve the life around it um, and not for what it looks like at all, as you can see. Um, so, for example, then, because it grows like that organically and it's not designed um, as such to start with, there's all sorts of traces left um, in the house where you can read the history. So, for example, here... You can see that pipe in the middle of the room. Well, that was because there used to be a wall there, and so that used to be two rooms. Um, and, for example, like that, uh, somebody needed uh, the bathroom to be bigger, and, well, my dad. Uh, and he really it didn't bother him at all that there was a window there, so he just kind of built it the way he wanted it, because he wanted the bathroom to be bigger. That wall blew down in a storm, and um, he just built it up and you can see the traces of like the really old bit of the wall and that old little um, window and then he's put in that uh, old wheel in there. But basically I'm just showing these, um, oh yeah that's my gran and that's an old doorstep so just to show like that's in our kitchen now where the inside of it is really, it's really modern and there's a modern floor like really kind of, it's actually quite a futuristic kind of plastic. And then that doorstep is one that my dad found over in the field where it used to be a famine village. There was a fam there was village there until the famine and then that doorstep was completely worn through. And you can imagine hundreds of years that had to wear that through to a shiny black stone. So the reason I'm showing you those things is because what I'm really interested in is um, change and how things change over time and that, just that notion of change and that we can't know any, any time we can't know what's going to happen in the future. So why then do um, most buildings and products, when we're designing them, why do they not take this into account? You know, um, things are so often designed just like as if they're a static thing. Um, and buildings are a lot more... We're a lot more used to adapting things and seeing them adapt over time. Like when people buy a house, the first thing they actually think is like, how can I adapt this? How can I make it my own? I want to build an extension. Oh, we need new windows. I'm going to paint the room. You know, the first thing they think, their mindset is adapting and how will I adapt this to my needs? Whereas when it comes... Um, and actually, there's an interesting... Just anyone that's interested in fur further reading on um, change and adapt ability in design. There's a really interesting book called How Buildings Learn by a guy called Stuart Brand, who's a um, super, super interesting guy who uh, has a lot of uh, very sort of um, amazing ideas about the future. He's a futurologist or whatever it's called. Um, and he has this um, 
book called How Buildings Learn, and uh, one case study in there is about uh, buildings that where creative things happen. So he's analysed what kind of buildings, where do inventions come from, where does um, new technology come from. And there's one very interesting case study about uh, the buildings in MIT where he was uh, based doing some research and um, there was uh, one building in MIT that was super, like it won loads of architecture awards and had this big glass foyer and everything. And then there was this other one, which was like built sometime in the Cold War, and it was built in six months. It was like just slapped up. But actually, like some of the most amazing inventions over the last like 50 years have come from that building. And all the scientists in MIT really have this affection for the building. But it's really like, it's pretty much like a prefab type thing. But they love it because every time like they want oh, the thing I'm building is too big. They actually just saw something out of the ceiling and just say to the neighbour, hey, do you mind? Like, I'll, I'll patch it up again later, don't worry about it. And everyone just has this sort of mindset where, like, what do we do, need to do to make it happen? And there's no kind of rules and regulation. It's just like, do it yourself. You know, if you want to do something, just try it out. Um, and I just find that really, really interesting as, uh, as an idea. So I was studying product design and I'm interested in all these ideas and thinking like, oh, you know, there has to be ways where we can design for change and, and these kind of um, um, ideas. This is just uh, one thing that I wanted to mention, which is an, an architecture model, um, which is it's used by UNESCO and it's called uh, the core units. And what it does is, it was a project in Kenya where they had to cope with something like 100,000 people coming into the country and they needed to provide housing for them. And the design strategy they used there was not um, to say, okay, well, let's build 100,000 boxes and we'll put them in there. What they did was they designed an infrastructure. So they put in water, electricity, and a, a little lockable room for each person and a foundations. And they didn't build a house for them. What they did was just provide this core unit and then people then, over time, as they got their site with their electricity and whatever, and it could even be internet, whatever it is, infrastructure, then they would build their house around it as they were able to afford it and with the materials they were able to find, whatever. So you can see that's a very, very interesting idea in terms of efficiency of resources. So it's not like you take a load of money, spend a load of money up front and build a big building, and then, oh, actually, it's not what we wanted. Um, it's like sort of saying, okay, how can we do this and let it grow over time and respond to the needs of the people that are gonna be in there. So anyway, that's an interesting strategy for me. Um, so, I was studying product design in um, the Royal College of Art in London uh, back in 2003 and um, I'm not the best designer in the world and uh, was finding it, I was quite struggling with designing things and finding my, my voice in that. So I ended up playing a lot with materials because I thought, okay, let's go a step back and that was something I was quite comfortable with. Um, and thinking, okay, materials could be uh, my thing. Um, it was a very kind of playful, messy process. There's nothing at all scientific involved in this. This is like serious, just craft, uh, well, very unserious, um, crafty, arty sort of stuff. So like mixing uh, concrete, what I did was that one there, um, that kind of bubbly looking one is concrete that I mixed with uh, beads from a, um, a bean bag, and then I burned those out with a, a liquid that, that dissolves that plastic, so it became like a concrete sponge. And then one day, one of my experiments was that I uh, m mixed together silicone bathroom sealant, horrible stuff, with uh, some really fine sawdust from the wood workshop in college. And I ended up making, you can see there, just in the uh, corner here, looks quite horrible, but um, it was just, it was basically a wooden ball. And I'd made, I'd mixed together those things, just like mixing bread or whatever. And then like 10 minutes later, I was bouncing it on the ground. I was just like, that's so amazing that you can make <coughs> something that looks like wood bounce. 
Um, and I don't know why I was so interested in it, but I just kind of got obsessed with doing things with this material. So I, made, I was making sculptures, um, and that was just an example of one thing. Um, and then I started covering things with it. So I covered this bike with it, and I was just really interested in the <laughs> sort of grossness of it. Like, it was just sort of really kind of otherworldly. Um, and I, I was just playing, really. And I thought, well, what would it mean if you had a rubbery bike? You know, if you could just throw it around or whatever, just being quite playful. Um, and then, because I used to mix it up, and then... Um, I'd have bits <coughs> left over, and I just without thinking about it, I started using it in my house to uh, make things work better. So one day I was washing up, and the washing up water was just kind of slowly going down as I was washing up. It was just so <coughs> annoying. Um, and I just got a bit of my gunk one day when I was uh, doing something probably to the bike and put it on the tap or put it on that sink uh, plug. Um, and then my boyfriend just kind of looked at me and was like, that's really like actually really interesting what you've just done. Like you're, m imagine if that was something that everyone could have. Like imagine if your granny was able to like, she's not able to open that jar, so she's able to just put a piece on and make it easy to open. Imagine if like what you're doing there like became something that was just normal for people to do. And I just kind of went, oh, light bulb. And I was like, that's really cool. Like, I didn't notice what I was doing, but yeah, that is really exciting. And, um, and it really kind of obviously struck a lot of chords with what I, was, uh, what I grew up with and all that change and stuff I was just talking about. Um, so I got kind of a bit obsessed with it and started drawing uh, ways that I thought p people would find this useful. So how could it be useful to people? Um, and just having fun with it got quite obsessed. Um, those are like, you know, I don't know, there's tw 20 there, and I did probably over a thousand um, illustrations. So it was just like basically a year drawing comic books, um, which was very fun. Um, and um, yeah, so for my uh, graduation pro project, then I made a comic book of all these ideas. Um, and the material didn't exist yet, but I was able to take it from the really ugly, sawdusty version to something that looked nice and colourful and stuff that I was able to show people, like, what if this existed? Um, and people at my show, uh, like, came through. In your graduation show, you basically have a little display and you show your ideas. So people came through and they were basically like, this is really handy, can I have some? Like, you know, it was already something that they, they wanted. So, um, but that was back in 2004, and from there, like obviously, I had no idea how to um, uh, how to develop it uh, further than that. Um, but what I did was, um, I went to my college has an innovation center, and I went to them and asked for help. And I said, look, I've got this thing, and people really like the idea, and they really um, seem to be, you know, very. Uh, excited about it, so you know, can you help me get it off the ground? Um, and they did. So they in, in, they introduced me to a guy who was working as a business advisor to the college. Um, his name's Roger, and I've worked with him ever since. Um, where we we set up a, a business together, and um, we hooked up. We looked around for scientists. So who, what scientists would be able to help us make this material? Because we'd looked into it, and as far as we knew, it didn't exist. But what we needed to do was to find some scientists who really would know, like, does it exist, does it not? Um, and we found two really fantastic um, scientists who had just retired from the silicone industry. So they'd been working all their life in a big American company called Dow Corning which is um, one of the biggest silicone groups in the world. And they'd worked all their life in the research and development there. And I was lucky enough to meet them a few months after they retired. And they had time to look into it. And they were like, no, we haven't heard of anything like this before. And um, so they kind of came on board. And we applied for some grants together. But basically, we had very, very little money. So I then had to learn science. And uh, they trained me. We built a small lab in a in a, in a, a little studio building in East London, um, and we we had our first grant. And they we built our lab for I don't know a few thousand pounds, and they 
taught me basically how to be a lab technician, which I did for about two years, which was basically like mixing uh, materials for about two years, uh, observing them, and then uh, coming up with a, a, for a chem chem chemical formulation that would do what we wanted it to do. So we, we knew like we wanted it to be safe, we wanted it to be dishwasher proof, all these sort of uh, features that we wanted. And then it was about designing the material to, to have all those features. So it was uh, an awful lot of hard work. Um, and that's just even before we got to the stage where I was started to be able to employ um, a scientist and things. Lots and lots of hands-on experiments um, you know, there was probably a period of a year when I was basically just looking at chewing gum samples, like, <laughs> you know, that's what it looks like now. Um, every day it was, you know, a, a, a hard slog to, to crack the first um, chemistry. Um, and I guess, like, the way it uh, happens is that, like, you, you, you've no money at the start at all. Grants are paying for everything and um, you know, you really need an awful lot of support because you're on your own. You've like, you know, I had an idea, and yeah, I had Roger, my business partner, and I had Ian and Steve, and we started to gather people around around you. But you really do need support when you're when you're doing a project. Um, and business partners, uh, I, I think one thing that I've learned is um, collaborating with people is like how how things can can happen. Um, yeah, and lots and lots of very good friends in um, design. So from the science side, obviously that's something very important, like the product has to work, it has to do what it, will, what it says it'll do. But on the other hand, um, nobody's really going to use this creatively unless um, they're inspired to do so, and that's where all of the design comes in. So we've got beautiful packaging design. Um, our website is really important. So it's all about um, our, our building our community and all of our customers, an awful lot, of really surprising amount of them interact with us through Twitter and Facebook and send us pictures which we put up on the website and those inspire other people. So that's really how it's working. Um, Lots and lots of trial users, so um, like I was saying at the start, the design of this, um, well, it was very important that it wasn't something that we put all the work into and then kind of launched it onto the world and then, oh, what's going to happen? All the way along, um, we were giving samples to people, um, anyone that liked it or liked the idea that we met at a party or that we met on the street or in a shop or whatever, that sort of said, wow, that sounds cool. Um, you know, when, when you have some samples ready, like, you know, I'd love to try it. Anyone that said that, we followed up and gave them samples and learned from them, like, what colours did they like, what, um, what worked, what didn't work, um, and really from a, uh, from a user's perspective. Um, I think one of the most challenging uh, parts of building a business or getting an invention uh, up and running is definitely uh, the money side uh, because being a creative person it's not something that you you know you didn't go and become a banker so um, there's some culture clashes um, and I had to do probably quite a lot more than a hundred investment pitches and uh, two of them were successful so um, you really like you know it did. There was you know a year or two there, like through the recession when we were pitching for investment, it, it, that was really really hard. Um, but um, you know in the end you know we stuck with it, and um, our investors are are great because in the end when an investor does buy in and and and, and they're doing it off their own bat because it's not exactly like you know. Uh, proven or whatever, it's very new. Um, we have some fantastic investors, so it's possible. 
Um, so all the way along, people sort of said, "Well, you're making a DIY product. It's got to be in B and Q, right? Um, you know, and you know, you better partner up with one of those glue companies because otherwise they'll just copy it and rip you off and whatever." So we made friends with um, all the sort of big glue brands. You know, I've been making friends with the marketing people and the research people in you know Pristic and Blue Tack and all of that. Um, and they're all really helpful, and they did help us in developing it uh, by giving us bits of advice and, and things. Uh, but none of them were prepared to put the money up to, to get Subaru out onto the market. 